hold on. Let's put this into the study with uh, viewer games. <coughs> viewer studies. Here we go. You're really on a run. You just got a turkey. You got three out of the lot. You got three out of three for the most recent. It's not the Kalashnikov anymore. No, it's the Sveshnikov. You transposed it to the Sveshnikov. Yeah, Black's not supposed to play Knight F6. Otherwise, it becomes Sveshnikov. So let's see where we could end up. Right. So here's the story. Normally, Black plays d6, and Fabiano Caruana, Fabiano Caruana would play knight d5. And so, one of my students earlier this week ran into somebody who had prepped this line against the Sveshnikov. And the line usually runs yada yada, and Magnus Carlsen played knight to b8 for the first several games of the uh, match in 2018. And in the 12th game, Magnus Carlsen played knight to e7 and went on to develop a large advantage, which he chose to draw in order to reach the tiebreaker. So there's a little bit of a skew there. So if you can imagine that that is the main line. Now, my student earlier in the week, if not by accident, plays this line and gets to this position. And instead of playing uh, b5, which is the old main line, and Lauren is saying bishop e7 at this very moment, which could well be the case, that is better. Uh, I haven't really looked into bishop e6 lines, even though the statistics look good among the masters. But knight f6 is not supposed to be good for black. So anyway, my student Lauren this morning ran into the fellow. He, he knows he's supposed to play knight d5 against this line. So his opponent played knight takes knight to d5, and he played. Nice. I definitely ran into somebody who knew what they were doing, and that's exactly what I wanted. Even though I think I escaped, I did not play the attack right. Yeah. So my student runs into this line, right? He's like, you've got so many kids out there who've been prepped with knight d5 against the Svestikov. Now you just put them in limbo right in between the Svestikov and the... And they have to think for themselves. So, yeah, so he went on to win the game handily against a much higher rated opponent. I can't believe, because he's around 16, 1700, he's playing a higher rated opponent. And he just basically takes their pawn. I don't know if they were flustered or what, and it was a slow time control, and it was a FIDE rated game. Which is crazy. I am bringing that up in the Windows uh, dim pool. It's the world of Skaki Bat. I cannot wait. I know I know I have underutilized Skaki Bot. I will be the first to admit it. I am the first. Uh-oh. Did I drop a frame? No. I thought for a moment that I had dropped a frame. Good morning, Ezrin. <laughs> um, only thing worse than not knowing an opening. Well, I'm on the other side of the coin there, Lauren. Just like this game where you outplayed the daylights out of me, I would say that most of the openings can be figured out in the slower time controls. I would say that in faster time controls, what you've said is true. If you're playing an opening in a fast time control with half of a knowledge of theory, it is far worse than anything. Yeah, but I think half knowing theory in a very slow game can get you there. You just can't 
Yeah, that is true. But if that's assuming that you are an openings player, I think. I think if you let... Yeah, it's, well, I don't know if it's fine. It's definitely not completely fine. But I know it's more fine because I live that way most of my life. Like, literally, I know a considerable amount of every opening. And I'm not even sure what I know is one-third of the knowledge of what Karawana knows about all those openings. Right? Like, who am I comparing the half to? Who am I comparing that half to? And I'm positive that... So we end up transposing. It still thinks it's a Kalashnikov over here. Even though we reached the main line of this variation fairly quickly. And Knight C4 was the move that I was expecting, by the way. Knight uh, C3 is a little unusual. B5 is usually already in. So we're still out of the Sveshnikov, I think. Are we still out of the Sveshnikov? Hold on, I need to compare this line for a moment. I believe we're still out of the Sveshnikov. Bishop G5, A6, Knight A3, B5, Knight D5. Aha! And this is the line that you know. So we're still not there. Yeah, I'm going 90. I should be going 97 and 96 faster than I did. But you were been keeping me busy on the B6 square and the dark squares. So I couldn't lift my uh, queen out or anything. So I was like, I don't know. So in any event, yeah, this is the Sveshnikov. The Lasker Pelican, as I learned it. I learned it originally as the Lasker Pelican. Then Sveshnikov came around. And I actually had this line against someone earlier. So do I want to return to this theory or don't I? That is the question. Now, previously, Pegasus had said that the stream was choppy when I was playing music. I'm curious if it's still choppy. I'm wondering if it's still choppy because this song is not allowed. I know I didn't have B5. That's good to know. I'm worried that it was just one. Yeah, I thought so. So here we go, Pegasus. I'm just wondering. Oh, uh-oh. Hold on, that's it. Now we're back. Now it should not be choppy. So for a long time, I had killed the music. And the real reason how those other streamers, like uh, Nemsko and Chesbra and all those other guys, they have music on their stream... Yes, and now it's not choppy. Uh, the music is cutting in and out. That is the choppy part. So the problem is that they have to listen to the music on their earbuds, and the music cannot play so that it affects the microphone. So if I were to have music, I would literally have to plug in to the Blue Yeti, um, just like Nemsco and everyone else does. I would have to have earbuds to have the music. And it'll be on a separate track, so it can be cut out by uh, Twitch and or YouTube. Because literally, the, then the six tracks that are being produced with the two different audio tracks for voice and music, and then there's a third track for sound alerts and all of that, everything can be edited separately. So meanwhile... Getting back to our game. So this is the other main difference. Bishop takes f6. Knight to g5. Yada, yada, yada. So yeah, knight to c4 is possible for you, Lord. And you can actually take this shortcut. Now, honestly, I don't know if knight to d4 is such a threat. Let's take a quick peek here. I don't normally consult this guy. So... Bishop g5 and b5 are of equal value. If I play b5, c3 becomes a real move. 
Bishop g5, knight to c4, bishop e6, knight on c to b6. Uh-oh. Therein lies the difference. You can always evict my knight later. But I've got a serious weakness on e6. That is the problem. And I'm going to be giving up the bishop, my lovely bishop pair that I thought I was getting. So I was going to skip forward in this line. Where white is plus uh, almost on his way to a clear advantage. So you could have taken advantage of the difference in the position with, with uh, knight to c4. Castles was... Too early on my part. Rook to b8. I considered bishop e6. I did just want to get on with it. So castles could get me into trouble. Uh, bishop e6. Knight e7. Bishop. I don't know if I like that line, but it looks pretty good. So I shouldn't be opening up myself to this attack so soon. I should wait until your king has decided itself. I started the attack before you castled. Right? Thinking that I could get something on your king because he's in the center. I wasted a thought. ha <laughs> ha. Um, no, that's definitely happened. I don't know if I would say that I got dominated on my dark squares. I definitely got taken advantage of on my dark squares. So I'm a little concerned about the... Yeah, I've tried that. Right now I'm on an omnidirectional microphone that's coming just toward me. But unfortunately, um... The way this, the acoustics in this room are, I think it's just the, the positioning of the speaker being to the left of the PC. That is internally really right. Wow. Got an audio master. Because there's a, there a couple of phrases in there that I have not heard outside of a how to set your microphone video. <laughs> You're replying to Paul. Oh, wait a minute. Is Paul 1e4 here? One second. Yes, he is. Good morning, Paul 1e4. I didn't realize that wasn't you because you had Lauren. I always feel like you should put the at to someone at the end of the question because uh, sometimes I get it mixed up with the person that is sending the comment. So it's Paul184, Lauren JW33, and I only saw the Lauren JW33 because she stood out in that series of. It is great to see you, Paul. So I was uh, testing out a new novelty here. And I'll probably... <laughs> no, of course, the two bishop advantage is negated by the weak d5 square and the blockaded backward d6 pawn. And uh, you have a great bishop. So in this particular position, I really considered knight a5. This is one where I really considered it. I also considered uh, F takes E4 in some of these positions. But you took right away, so that leaves only Knight A5, which leaves me, I don't know, a little bit of skew. 
I also considered b5 in this position. b5 in this position, and if bishop to b3, maybe that's what I should have done. So up here you can see that they only go bishop d3. So b5, if you're really insistent on keeping it on that diagonal, then I get to scarf the bishop with knight a5, which is my plan. Nevertheless, the bishop takes f5 is, according to this thing, very equal. Probably transposes to normal theory. <laughs> call me old-fashioned. I would call you a student of Teresh, which is the same thing. He is a bit from that particular century. The dynamics of, uh, of the d6 pawn are weighed out by the prospects on the king side, I have to admit. So what happens here? Let's just see what's going on. So obviously, this was a really lame move. Bishop e6 was actually one of the first moves that occurred to me, and just keeping the bishop pair is key. That is what I should have done. And now I know it for, for fact. I literally gave away my bishop pair and a huge um, and gave up a huge amount of squares so that you could bother my bother me on those squares. So I was under the delusion that I was doing okay. And now I'm doing okay again. Knight to g6, yes. Queen to d2. And queen to g5 should have been played right away. Queen h4 also occurred to me. So in this position, Queen H4 is probably a better prospect because of the because of the uh, bothersome nature on the bishop. Was there room for F3? This was also a move that I really wanted to play, but I didn't necessarily want to give up the possibilities here. So this is how I should have played it. I should have followed through on my idea. So in this previous position, I actually thought you were going to play f3. After knight d5, knight g6. Yes, I thought you were going to play f3 here. And it would have been good for you. You could have stopped the whole attack. <laughs> you can save one. Saw this game live. Think for Queen Z5. Yeah. You are being mated actually after this, though. If you don't move this pawn and you play Queen D2, I feel like you're getting mated. G3 is forced, 95 gaining time. You may need to give up the bishop with queen d4. Can you play 93? This is another move that I didn't necessarily like by playing it so soon. Wow. What a move. What a move. I feel like I should be doing a Christopher Walken impression. Yes, I agree, Pegasus. I did ultimately get it in. So queen g5 here. And I was concerned that f3 would be played, obviously. And I didn't think that knight h4 would give me anything just yet. I was still trying to get toward the d3 square. I wanted to weaken the d3 square. 
Perhaps it was just better to go this way. So you can see where my plan was going. I was going toward the d3 square with knight e5, but I wanted to play knight e5. I wanted to eliminate the tension on my uh, on my pawn on f4. So bishop d7 again eliminates the pressure here. Possibly reroutes the bishop to another square. Bishop e6 okay. I guess it thinks it is. It has finally returned to my queen g5 at the top of the lineup. f3 and king h1 are recommended. And even here, I did not play knight h4. I played f3 first, but I should have played knight h4. And now at f3, I get away with this. Three pieces attacking. And the knight has no squares. That's craziness. It's being attacked three times, defended twice, and it has no squares. I'm getting lucky here, Lauren. <laughs> well, you're absolutely correct. I'm afraid that I sort of thought the same thing. If I do not checkmate you, I am not winning the end game. That much is true, which is why I threw away the pawn. I threw away the pawn, so this is absolutely correct. Um, Knight h4 should be absolutely correct. All right, I take it back. It's clearly better for black. I don't really like black is better. I think it should be more. In any event, going back to throwing away the pawn, I did have the discovery. I was focused on this one, but I failed to see that one. Why did I not see that one? I was looking at the discovery. I thought that you could not play queen f3. And I was focused on this discovery, and my timing was way off. So I play this move in order to go bishop d3. You oppose queens. I'm down a pawn. <coughs> it's actually not that bad. I know the computer thinks that it's uh, it's completely lost, but it's not that bad. No thought, but it's not that bad. John Fedora, it's not that bad, John. I think you might have something here. So life is getting tough. Yeah, this was what I was looking at. I also looked at this move. My rook is overworked, actually. I have to stay guarding the knight while this one continues across to bother me. The other move I considered was rook e7 in this position as well. Rook e7, when I played knight c4, I basically opened the door to e7. Ha, 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 well, I definitely played something that I did not know, because it's all novelty. So queen takes d6, and queen e8 was my next move. And for whatever reason, I was trying to see if I could get away with queen g5 again, but then my rook is hanging. So I didn't really have a choice here. And this is tactics training here. I just need to play the move that I need to play. And the only move that I have in this position is queen to e8. But I flagged. I thought I could think. I'm spoiled by the rapid time controls. Hold on. Bishop c2, queen g3, f takes g3. Hold on. I'm turning that off. 
But so bishop c2, queen g3, queen g3, f g3, Oh, I have to play this. Bishop takes d1. Compensation. Not a worry. Yeah, it's it's been there for a while. It was there in the other line. That's why when, uh, when my knight disappeared and went on a sojourn, and then she reached the final position where she is playing queen takes d6. I thought I could play queen g5 for a brief moment. And I knew my rook wasn't attacked. So that's what caused me to flag, actually. The knight not being on g6 actually caused me to flag in this position because I wanted to play this move. And I realized I have no thing covering my rook. So I just had to play queen e8. Very silly of me. So I flagged and my rating tanked. I need to reset the follower goal here. Quick, quick, quick. Quick, quick, quick. I really should do it every 25 follows. <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, I don't really believe that you ever lose rating points. Whatever your rating is, whatever your strength is, it just returns like the temperature of the day. Cold wind comes by, gets chilly, returns to the temperature of the day. Ratings are like the weather. They come and they go. No, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> no, that's not true. I play all the theory. But I have no idea what I'll be playing at any given moment. It's true. Charles followed me. Pioneer Chess School. I actually want to revive the Pioneer um, house concept in the free world. That's another thing in the back of my mind that I would like to do. Basically the Pioneer's Palaces. <laughs> uh, B5 in the car is an age-old concept. It just isn't played by top players very often. It has been played in the bullet events. Uh, I think that's where I saw it last by the... It wasn't Magnus Carlsen. It was somebody in the tournament that Magnus Carlsen was playing in, one of those titled arenas. And when he played b5, I'm like, oh yeah, there's always that move. Because I like to play g6 against knight c3. But b5 is very similar. It's in the old book by Swayton. Alexa, turn on dojo. Oh. Isn't it an amazing world that we live in? That we just ask for the lights to be on, and the lights are on. Let's see who he gives credit to. Oh no, it was Far News. Was it Far News or was it Swayton? Where's my Swayton book? Let's find out. I'm pretty sure it's in here, but I believe it's in the Swayton book as well. Of course, they discounted on positional grounds, which is understandable. Play the Karakon. This is a brand new edition of this book that I uh, 
recently purchased, my old one fell apart. I literally had gone through it and through it, and my old one fell apart. So the original Caro and earlier deviations, 40. So do we have the earlier deviations? Nope. It's possible he doesn't have it here. Blumick, Alakine, Poland, 1941. So the way this book is uh, set up, he introduces all of the ideas of the opening, and then he gives uh, the illustrative games. So I think I'm going to have to return to this one. So he'll give the Bronstein variation. Bronstein, Larson, G takes F6 of the mainline Caro. And then he gives Bilek, Bronstein, Bellon, Larson, Peter, Sarawan, 1984, um, Rodriguez, Petiris, and Brown, Bellon. I'm not sure if Bellon is the same Bellon, but I believe it is, who is Anna Kramling's father, by the way. Bellon is playing black in this particular position. Oh, no, he's on the white side against Larson in Las Palmas, 1976. Sikolsky uh, Bronstein as well. So he, this book is actually a far better book than I ever imagined. It really is. Advanced Variation, Pano, Pan of Attack. All right, so let's look under E4, E6. E4, C6, D4, D5, Barius. Knight, C3. And he goes, the bizarre B5 ought to be examined here. Zaitsev, Gurganitz, 1968, was the stem game. Tall, Gurganitz, 1968. Tall also, Tall got a good position. with a3 tall got a good position with a3 against b5 kuprecek milan 1977 anna kremling's father i believe keeps coming up i'm not sure isn't that her, her father have i had time to watch the youtube movie Oh, but B5 is not garbage. That one does look like garbage, however. Or is it? Let's see. One second here, Paul. I'm not entirely sure what you consider garbage, so I have to actually check this out. Um, hold on here. E4, E5. I believe Lasker played Queen F6. Because Bishop B5, Lasker played Queen F6 in this position. And it had some merit. It had merit on three counts. We're still playing Knight on G to F E7 after Bishop C5. We're holding the D4 square against D4 pawn promotion. So if, Paul, the opening that you describe is garbage, which it could be, because it doesn't have as much point as this one, for example, right? So, for example, John Fedorowicz was white against Boris Paczynski. I believe that took place in Ohio in 1996. Boris Paczynski, that's crazy. I have blast from the past, some of those names. I feel for this uh, poor 2200 who lost his white. Ruben Rodriguez, Sergio Moratti. Oh, I forgot about Moratti. Moratti was one of Italy's earliest titled players along with Tatai. Not in that position that you described, no. Right? Nobody in the database plays Queen F6 in the position that you describe. Which is why, yeah. 
But on move three, I remember seeing this played by Edward Lasker, maybe in New York 1924. I'm going to throw that date out there because if I'm if I'm right, I look like a super genius because I believe that Edward Lasker may have played this in New York 1924 and 1927. So I could be off in one of the New York tournaments. <laughs> and I was pretty impressed. I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Does that really work? It has merit, right? It controls d4. It... Uh, Puts the queen on an active square. White's knight hardly ever goes to d5 to go to c7. So it's pretty interesting. Although knight to c3 is one of the best moves in the position. Just take advantage of this weak square. And then black has to rush his control over d5. So in your line, after bishop to b5, the Steinitz line. I think the only one that I would actually recommend is maybe queen e7. If I were to go outside the line of uh, of thinking here. Right? Queen e7 to try to hold the position. Queen f6. Does not make sense to me. Queen e7 sort of makes sense because we're attacking the e4 pawn. So, for example, even though no one played any this move here, we're already holding this square. We're already putting our bishop on this diagonal. So I don't think that queen f6 fits for multiple reasons. What do you think? If you find your hand on your queen on move 4 in this position... <laughs> You have to go one square diagonally. Obviously, queen d7 loses to d5. That's the end of the road as we know it. But after queen e7, d5, a6, it just gets a little sketchy. I'm sure white is much better here, but it's not unplayable. Uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm extrapolating. I'm extrapolating to a real life scenario. I actually don't. Uh, I don't think I ever think in terms of online chess. I'm except for bullet. I guess if I'm thinking about very fast time controls, I don't think of that as over the board at all. on what to do about this position. Yeah, it's only plus three for white. Plus point three. Even though white has an extra pawn, it's not that difficult to play. So, now we get to prove. Everything in this position is bad for, for black, if you must know the truth, right? Everything in this position is bad for black, in my honest opinion strategically it's not bad for black you know in a sense that somebody shouldn't play it but this is definitely taking the bolt by the horns and uh, e takes d4 is the only move to me giving up the center so after queen e7 this oh oh after the yeah queen f6 sorry queen e7 knight to c3 is the annoying part and there's no way to stop knight to d5. I think it has to be played right away. I hallucinated that I could capture on d4 and get something on this square, but I cannot. Yep, white's clearly better. Can't touch that queen. Can't touch this. Do, 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 do. That's Pegasus' cue. <laughs> Can't touch this. Ah! Oh. So queen f6, on the other hand, is not best met by knight c3 because of bishop d6. Paul, do you have any of the Dangerous Weapons series of books? Yeah, I agree, Pegasus. The other moves are better. 
I'm only discussing this one as uh, it's uh, related in theme to what Paul was asking about with the D4 square being in mind. So C3 makes sense as perhaps the best move against it. John Fedorowicz played this way. Boris Basinski played Bishop C5. Robert Hungoski, 2011. Wait, just one moment. You know, that has to be a World Youth Team Championship. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I'm thinking 2001. When I first met Robert Hungoski, it was like in the World Under-12 Championships or the Pan American Collegiates in 2004. So I was thinking this was around 2001, 2004. Never heard of them. So yeah, I just thought of, that's okay. So everything here is good for white. Boris Pasinski used to play a lot on the, uh, on the, what was it? In those days, they had the Church's Fried Chicken Grand Prix. And Larry Christensen writes extensively in Rocking the Ramparts. And Rocking the Ramparts and Storming. Darn it. I'm getting old. I can't remember book titles. Come on. Rocking the ramparts. Oh, where are you? Barlov, Burgess, Burn. Oh, did I put it? I put it amongst the world. Well, I put Christensen in here because these were biographical. No. All right, this is starting to bother me now. Christensen. Colin Crouch. Oh, there it is. Storming the Barricades and Rocking the Ramparts. Two very interesting bio books, which are really great. Decent covers. Gambit Publishing. Lessons in Attacking Chess from a Top American Grandmaster. I'm not sure which one came first. I'm trying to remember. Whether it was Rocking the Ramparts. I think uh, Storm of the Barricades came first. Larry Christensen, by the way, is one of the few grandmasters who were who was never an international master or a FIDE master. He went from untitled to grandmaster in one go. He went from untitled to Grandmaster in Von Go. I need to set up another reward. I want to do the games of the top three players of a U.S. championship. Maybe I should just do the top two players of a U.S. championship. U.S. championship winners games. That'll be easier. Because Larry Christensen tied with Ryshevsky and Yastra Sarawan in 1981. Hold on. Let me look. 1981. Larry Christensen, Sammy Ryshevsky got his eighth, I believe. U.S. Championship tie. All right. I better organize my book better in this place. Very, very bothersome. Here it is. 
unfortunately, I'm missing a buck. Fifteen gifted subs for an entire U.S. championship. I mean, for an entire world championship match. That's what I should do. That that Topolov uh, was a lot of games. Let's see here. The cross table here. This is Walter Brown, Larry Christensen, and Jinji Ashvili. This was 1983. Here's 1981. 1981 U.S. Chess Championship. These books were written by Larry Christensen. Picture of a young Larry Christensen here. He is easily one of my favorite players. Uh, originally, when I first started out, before I moved to the East Coast, Nick DeFermian was one of my uh, favorites. So here's uh, three photos of Sammy Ryshevsky, a very young Grandmaster Joel Benjamin with hair, and Lubos Kavalak, also known as Lubomir Kavalak. And I went through all of these games. Robert Byrne played, had a great relationship and friendship with Grandmaster Robert Byrne. We were always supposed to go to his favorite French restaurant on the Upper West, on the Upper East Side, which was Bistro du Nord. I eventually got there for lunch on a particular day. I cannot remember at what moment I did, but it was a lovely place. Grandmaster Walter Brown and I were also very good friends. I worked with him on the Walter Brown Blitz Chess, Chess Association, also known as the World Blitz Chess Association. When we referred to it as the WBCA, I ran the events at the Marshall Chess Club under the WBCA banner and flag. They have a picture of Benko in here, also a good friend from the old days. There are many games in this book that do not have annotations. I wonder if we can amend that. Putting out a better book, annotating all of the games. Like, are these games only the games from the articles that appeared in Chess Life? That's what I'm wondering. So let's see here. The winners of 1980, 81. Oh, the 1981 U.S. Open. Never mind. The tournament series. It tells you the games. There's no cross table here. Oh, there it is. Found it. So it was only Brown and Sirowan that won the 1981 U.S. Championship. So it must be the 1980 U.S. Championship. The 1980 U.S. Championship must be the one. And I do not have that one. Dude, time to get on Amazon. That's it. Enough said. Time to get on the shtick with Amazon. So Jesse February is a Twitch streamer. I don't actually know how to find her. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna actually have to look it up to make sure that I get her name correct. Oh, she's streaming. All right, let's raid Jesse February on her birthday. Quick. And that way. She'll know that we're thinking about her. Wish her a happy birthday. Paul, 1E4, thank you so much. Cheers. Please enjoy Jesse. She is a great streamer. She works very hard. She's working on it. Uh, have a great afternoon, Pegasus. Thank you for the gifted sub, MD Knight. 
I'm adding MD Knight to the uh, legends of the stream. He's always gifting subs. Pegasus, certainly, as the number one gifted uh, bits leader, should also be there. It is coffee time indeed. Cheers, everyone. Have a great day. Please be sure to wish Jesse February a happy birthday from MCD. Or if you have any emotes to use, you can definitely do that too. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Cheers. I think my favorite emote lately has been this one. The Dojo emote. Ciao. You know.